The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, Chapter 15, Something You Shouldn't Have Done. For several weeks, the rain was on and off and on and off, and Bruno and Schmoll did not see as much of each other as they would have liked. When they did meet, Bruno found he was starting to worry about his friend because he seemed to be getting even thinner by the day, and his face was growing more and more gray. Sometimes he brought more bread and cheese with him to give to Schmoll. And from time to time, he even managed to hide a piece of chocolate cake in his pocket. But the walk from the house to the place on the fence where the two boys met was a long one, and sometimes Bruno got hungry on the way, and found that one bite of cake would lead to another, and that in turn led to another. And by the time there was only one mouthful left, he knew it would be wrong to give that to Schmoll, because it would only tease his appetite and not satisfy it. Father's birthday was coming up soon, and although he had said he didn't want to fuss, Mother arranged for a party for all the officers serving it out with, and a great fuss was made to prepare for it. Every time she sat down to make more plans for the party, Lieutenant Cotler was there beside her to help, and between them they seemed to make more lists than could ever possibly be needed. Bruno decided to make a list of his own, a list of all the reasons why he didn't like Lieutenant Cotler. There was the fact that he never smiled and always looked as if he was trying to find somebody to cut out of his will. On the rare occasions that he spoke to Bruno, he addressed him as little man, which was just plain nasty because, as Mother pointed out, he just hadn't had his growth spurt yet. Not to mention the fact that he was always in the living room with Mother and making jokes with her, and Mother laughed at his jokes more than she laughed at Father's. Once when Bruno was watching the camp from his bedroom window, he saw a dog approach the fence and start barking loudly, and when Lieutenant Cotler heard it, he marched right over to the dog and shot it. That was then there was all the nonsense that Gretel came out with whenever he was around. And Bruno still hadn't forgotten the evening with Pavel, the waiter who was really a doctor, and how angry the young lieutenant had been. Also, whenever father was called away to Berlin on an overnight trip, the lieutenant hung around the house as if he were in charge. He would be there when Bruno was going to bed, and be back again in the morning before he even woke up. Then there was a lot more reasons why Bruno didn't like Lieutenant Cutler, but these were the first things that came to his mind. On the afternoon before the birthday party, Bruno was in his room with the door open when he heard Lieutenant Cutler arriving at the house and speaking to someone, although he couldn't hear anyone answering back. A few minutes later, as he was coming downstairs, he heard Mother giving instructions about what needed to be done, and Lieutenant Cutler saying, don't worry, this one knows which side of his bread is buttered on, and then laughing in a nasty way. Bruno walked towards the living room with a new book Father had given him called Treasure Island, intending to sit in there for an hour or two while he read it. But as he walked through the hallway, he ran into Lieutenant Cotler, who was just leaving the kitchen. Hello, little man, the soldier said, sneering at him as usual. Hello, said Bruno, frowning. What are you up to, then? Bruno stared at him and started thinking of even more reasons to dislike him. I'm going in there to read my book, he said, pointing towards the living room. Without a word, Cotler whipped the book out of Bruno's hands and started to flick through it. Treasure Island, he said. What's it about, then? Well, there's an island, said Bruno slowly, to make sure the soldier could keep up. And there's treasure on it. I could have guessed that, said Cotler, looking at him as if there were things he would do to the boy if he were a son of his and not the son of the commandant. Tell me something I don't know about it. There's a pirate in it, said Bruno, called Long John Silver and a boy called Jim Hawkins. An English boy, said Cotler. Yes, said Bruno. Grunt, grunted Cotler. Bruno stared at him and wondered how long it would be before he gave back his book. He didn't seem particularly interested in it, but when Bruno reached for it, he pulled it away. Sorry, he said, holding on to it again. And when Bruno reached for it, he pulled it away for a second time. Oh, I'm sorry, he repeated, and held it out once more. And this time, Bruno swiped it out of his hands quicker than he could pull it away. Aren't you quick, muttered Lieutenant Cotler between his teeth. Bruno tried to step past him, but for some reason, Lieutenant Cotler seemed to want to talk to him today. All set for the party, are we? he asked. Well, I am, said Bruno, who had been spending more time with Gretel lately and had developed a liking for sarcasm. I can't speak for you. There'll be a lot of people here, said Lieutenant Cotler, breathing in heavily and looking all around, as if it were his house and not Bruno's. We'll be on our best behavior, won't we? Well, I'll be, said Bruno. Can't speak for you. 
You've a lot to say for such a little man, said Lieutenant Cutler. Bruno narrowed his eyes and wished he were taller, stronger, and eight years older. A ball of anger exploded inside him and made him wish that he had the courage to say exactly what he wanted to say. It was one thing he decided to be told what to do by mother and father. That was perfectly reasonable and to be expected. But it was another thing entirely to be told what to do by someone else, even by someone with a fancy title like lieutenant. Oh, Kurt, precious, you're still here, said mother, stepping out of the kitchen and coming towards them. I have a little free time now if... Oh, she said, noticing Bruno standing there. Bruno, what are you doing here? I was going into the living room to read my book, said Bruno, or I was trying to, at least. We'll run along into the kitchen for the moment, she said. I need a private word with Lieutenant Cutler. And they stepped into the living room together as Lieutenant Cutler closed the doors in Bruno's face. Seething with anger, Bruno went into the kitchen and got the biggest surprise of his life. There, sitting at the table... A long way from the other side of the fence was Schmoll. Bruno could barely believe his eyes. Schmoll, he said, what are you doing here? Schmoll looked up, and his terrified face broke into a broad smile when he saw his friend standing there. Bruno, he said. What are you doing here, repeated Bruno, for although he still didn't quite understand what took place on the other side of the fence, there was something about the people from there that made him think they shouldn't be here in his house. He brought me, said Schmoll. He, asked Bruno. You don't mean Lieutenant Cotler. Yes, he said there was a job for me to do here. And when Bruno looked around, he saw 64 small glasses, the ones Mother used when she was having one of her medicinal sherries, sitting on the kitchen table and beside them a bowl of warm, soapy water and lots of paper napkins. What on earth are you doing? asked Bruno. They asked me to polish the glasses, said Schmoll. They said they needed someone with tiny fingers. As if to prove something that Bruno already knew, he held out his hand and Bruno couldn't help but notice that it was like the hand of a pretend skeleton that Herr Litz had brought with him one day when they were studying human anatomy. i never noticed before, he said in a disbelieving voice, almost to himself. Never noticed what? asked Schmoll. In reply, Bruno held out his own hand, so that the tips of their middle fingers were almost touching. Our hands, he said. They're so different. Look. The two boys looked down at the same time, and the difference was easy to see. Although Bruno was small for his age, and certainly not fat, his hand appeared healthy and full of life. The veins weren't visible through the skin, the fingers weren't little more than dying twigs. Schmoll's hand, however, told a very different story. How did it get like that? he asked. I don't know, said Schmoll. It used to look more like yours, but I didn't notice it changing. Everyone on my side of the fence looks like this now. Bruno frowned. He thought about the people in their striped pajamas and wondered what was going on at Outwith and whether it wasn't a very bad idea if it made people look so unhealthy. None of it made any sense to him. Not wanting to look at Schmoll's hand any longer, Bruno turned round and opened the refrigerator, rooting about inside it for something to eat. There was half a stuffed chicken left over from lunchtime, and Bruno's eyes sparkled in delight for there were very few things in life that he enjoyed more than cold chicken with sage and onion stuffing. He took a knife from the drawer and cut himself a few healthy slices, and coated them with the stuffing before turning back to his friend. "'I'm very glad you're here,' he said, speaking with his mouth full. "'If only you didn't have to polish the glasses, I would show you my room.' He told me not to move from this seat or there'd be trouble. "'I wouldn't mind him,' said Bruno, trying to sound braver than he really was. "'This isn't his house. It's mine.' And when father's away, I'm in charge. Can you believe he's never even read Treasure Island? Schmoll looked as if he wasn't really listening. Instead, his eyes were focused on the slices of chicken and stuffing that Bruno was throwing casually into his mouth. After a moment, Bruno realized that he was looking at and immediately felt guilty. I'm sorry, Schmoll, he said quickly. I should have given you some chicken, too. Are you hungry? That's a question you never have to ask me, said Schmoll who, although he had never met Gretel in his life, knew something about sarcasm, too. "'Wait there. I'll cut some off for you,' said Bruno, opening the fridge and cutting another three healthy slices. "'No, if he comes back,' said Schmoll, shaking his head quickly and looking back and forth towards the door. "'If who comes back? You don't mean Lieutenant Cotler. "'I'm just supposed to be cleaning the glasses,' he said, looking at the bowl of water in front of him in despair, and then looking back to the slice of chicken that Bruno held out to him. He's not going to mind, said Bruno, who was confused by how anxious Schmoll seemed. It's only food. 
I can't, said Schmoll, shaking his head and looking as if he was going to cry. He'll come back. I know he will. He continued, his sentence running quickly together. I should have eaten them when you offered them. Now it's too late. If I take them, he'll come in and... Schmoll, here, said Bruno, stepping forward and putting the slices in his friend's hand. Just eat them. There's lots left for our tea. You don't have to worry about that. The boy stared at the food in his hand for a moment and then looked up at Bruno with wide and grateful but terrified eyes. He threw one more glance in the direction of the door, and then seemed to make a decision, because he thrust all three slices into his mouth in one go, and gobbled them down in twenty seconds flat. "'But you don't have to eat them so quickly,' said Bruno. "'Or make yourself sick.' "'I don't care,' said Schmoll, giving a faint smile. "'Thank you, Bruno.' Bruno smiled back, and he was about to offer him some more food, but just at that moment Lieutenant Cotler reappeared in the kitchen, and stopped when he saw the two boys talking. Bruno stared at him, feeling the atmosphere grow heavy, sensing Schmoll's shoulders shrinking down as he reached for another glass and began polishing. Ignoring Bruno, Lieutenant Cutler marched over to Schmoll and glared at him. "'What are you doing?' he shouted. "'Didn't I tell you to polish these glasses?' Schmoll nodded his head quickly and started to tremble a little as he picked up another napkin and dipped it in the water. "'Who told you that you were allowed to talk in this house?' continued Cutler. Do you dare to disobey me? No, sir, said Schmoll quickly. I'm sorry, sir. He looked up at Lieutenant Cutler, who frowned, leaning forward slightly and tilting his head as he examined the boy's face. Have you been eating? he asked in a quiet voice, as if he could scarcely believe it himself. Schmoll shook his head. You have been eating, insisted Lieutenant Cutler. Did you steal something from the fridge? Schmoll opened his mouth and closed it. He opened it again and tried to find words, but there were none. He looked towards Bruno, his eyes pleading for help. "'Answer me,' shouted Lieutenant Cutler. "'Did you steal something from the fridge?' "'No, sir, he gave it to me,' said Schmoll, tears welling up in his eyes as he threw a sideways glance at Bruno. "'He's my friend,' he added. "'Your,' began Lieutenant Cutler, looking across at Bruno in confusion. He hesitated. "'What do you mean, he's your friend?' he asked. "'Do you know this boy, Bruno?' Bruno's mouth dropped open, and he tried to remember the way you used your mouth if you wanted to say the word yes. he never seen anyone look so terrified, as Schmoll did at that moment, and he wanted to say the right thing to make things better. But then he realized that he couldn't, because he was feeling just as terrified himself. "'Do you know this boy?' repeated Cutler in a louder voice. "'Have you been talking to the prisoners?' "'I... he was here when I came in,' said Bruno. "'He was cleaning glasses.' "'That's not what I asked you,' said Cutler." Have you seen him before? Have you talked to him? Why does he say you're his friend? Bruno wished he could run away. He hated Lieutenant Cotler, but he was advancing on him now, and all Bruno could think of was the afternoon when he had seen him shooting a dog and the evening when Favelle had made him so angry that he... Tell me, Bruno, sh- shouted Cotler, his face growing red. I won't ask you a third time. I've never spoken to him, said Bruno immediately. I've never seen him before in my life. I don't know him. Lieutenant Cotler nodded and seemed satisfied with the answer. Very slowly, he turned his head back to look at Schmoll, who wasn't crying anymore, merely staring at the floor and looking as if he was trying to conceive his soul not to live inside of his tiny body anymore, but to slip away and sail through the door and rise up into the sky, gliding through the clouds until it was very far away. "'You will finish polishing all these glasses,' said Lieutenant Cotler, in a very quiet voice now so quiet that Bruno almost couldn't hear him. It was as if all of his anger had changed into something else. Not quite the opposite, but something unexpected and dreadful. And then I will come to collect you and bring you back to the camp, where we will have a discussion about what happens to boys who steal. This is understood, yes? Schmoll nodded and picked up another napkin and started to polish another glass. Bruno watched as his fingers shook and knew that he was terrified of breaking one. His heart sank but as much as he wanted to, he couldn't look away. Come on, little man, said Lieutenant Cotler, coming towards Bruno now and putting an unfriendly arm around his shoulder. You have, you go to the living room now and read your book and leave this little to finish his work. He used the same word he had used to Bavel when he had sent him to find the tire. Bruno nodded and turned round and left the kitchen without looking back. His stomach churned inside him and he thought for a moment that he was going to be sick. He had never felt so ashamed in his life. He had never imagined that he could behave so cruelly. 
He wondered how a boy who thought he was a good person really could act in such a cowardly way towards a friend. He sat in the living room for several hours but couldn't concentrate on his book and didn't dare to go back into the kitchen until later that evening when Lieutenant Cutler had already come back and collected Schmoll and taken him away again. Every afternoon that followed, Bruno returned to the place in the fence where they met, but Schmoll was never there. After almost a week, he was convinced that he had done was so terrible that he would never be forgiven. But on the seventh day, he was delighted to see that Schmoll was waiting for him, sitting cross-legged on the ground as usual and staring at the dust beneath him. Schmoll, he said, running towards him and sitting down, almost crying with relief and regret. I'm so sorry, Schmoll. I don't know why I did it. Say you'll forgive me. It's all right, said Schmoll, looking up at him now. There was a lot of bruising on his face and Bruno grimaced. For a moment he forgot about his apology. What happened to you? He asked and then didn't wait for an answer. Was it your bicycle? Because that happened to me back in Berlin a couple of years ago. I fell off when I was going too fast and was black and blue for weeks. Does it hurt? I don't feel it anymore, said Schmoll. It looks like it hurts. I don't feel anything anymore, said Schmoll. Well, I'm sorry about last week, said Bruno. I hate that Lieutenant Cutler. He thinks he's in charge, but he isn't. He hesitated for a moment, not wanting to get sidetracked. He felt that he should say it one last time and really mean it. I'm very sorry, Schmoll, he said in a clear voice. I can't believe I didn't tell him the truth. I've never let a friend down like that before. Schmoll, I'm ashamed of myself. And when he said that, Schmoll smiled and nodded, and Bruno knew that he was forgiven. And then Schmoll did something that he had never done before. He lifted the bottom of the fence up like he did whenever Bruno brought him food. But this time he reached his hand out and held it there, waiting for Bruno as he did the same. And then the two boys shook hands and smiled at each other. It was the first time they had ever touched.